Flint, it's an absolute honor to have you on my show today, man. You made my childhood amazing. You made many people's, millions of people's childhood absolutely incredible. G.I. Joe, Transformers, we're going to unpack that in a moment. But I just want to ask you, brother, how you doing, man? Ah, just great. We're sitting here on a Wednesday afternoon, uh, but we're here now. So we're here yeah. now. So let's unpack this bad boy. OK, let's get right into it. Like I was saying, you're responsible for like some of my fondest childhood memories. And also, obviously, the death of Optimus Prime was probably not my favorite childhood memory, but it needed to happen. I went actually to see the movie in the theaters last night for probably like the 100th time that I've watched this film. It was necessary and needed to happen. But I just want to talk to you about your start, your rise into entertainment. Like what got you into wanting to write and be such a great film creator? Uh, I mean, you know, it was, uh, I got out of college, uh, you know, undergraduate college and had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. So uh, I, you know, <laughs> I, was, I was kind of sitting around my parents' house at a place in Carmel, really cool place. And, you know, I had its guest house on a cliff and was writing my first novel. And uh, I, uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, just didn't know what I wanted to do. And my father was saying, well, you know, uh, you know, you, you, you probably will do something that doesn't exist now. So you've got to prepare for it. Right. And so I just did, did the mature thing and went to film school. So I went down to USC, uh, did the master's degree in cinema and, and then got out of that and I had a couple spec scripts, you know, I don't know what I thought I was going to be doing or what I was going to be writing, but, uh, in the end I ended up, uh, you know, the first person that hired me, which kind of determines what you do was Joe Ruby, who uh, had was half of a company called Ruby Spears. And and Joe and his partner, Ken Spears, created Scooby-Doo, and they got their own you know studio for it. And all of a sudden, I was writing Saturday morning and thinking, hey, this is really fun. Uh, and I'm good at it. And I, you know, I just I just like doing it. So I, you know, kept going on that on that track for a while. I kind of kind of swerved into games it, kind of exactly around that time I met Gary Gygax. But at that point, you couldn't make a living you know, doing games. So I was doing uh, animation and loved it. And you're also a history buff. Did that like factor into like the GI Joe and Transformers at all? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. I yeah. And I mean, that. yeah, I was an ancient history major in college. So I mean, what do you expect? You know, I, and I mean, you can see it just all over. I mean, I was, when I was rewatching the Transformer movie, uh, I mean, so much of it, you know, I feel like I was ripping off the Aeneid and Iliad, you know, and, you know, it's like, but, but, you know, when you're taking from stuff like that, you know, that's, yeah, nobody knows. Um, but uh, yeah, that, no, that was, that, that's just, you know, fundamental. It's, it's something that has served me incredibly well my entire career. And so you came on the Transformers in season two, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. I was, I was first on, I, I had left the Lucasfilm yeah, after, a, a, you know, a brutal experience in like, I would say summer 84 and, and probably a month or two later, Steve Gerber asked me if I would uh, help him story edit some episodes of G.I. Joe. And so, uh, yeah, sure. And I started doing it. It was really fun and they liked what I was doing. So they said they wanted to hire me as a producer as a, as a, uh, I was a associate producer. That's what I was first. And I was it, a co-producer. I still don't know what any of those titles mean, but that's what I was. <laughs> with GI Joe. Uh, did you do the PSAs at the end? Like knowing's half the battle. I, I am quite sure I wrote PSAs. I remember being back in Manhattan doing some of, but no, that was usually that was like the KP for writers. You know, it's like you know, I, you know, that was uh, we we do like voice that off on somebody. You know, nobody, nobody wanted to write the PSAs, even though we found them pretty entertaining. You know, it's just like you, know, you didn't want to spend your afternoon writing PSAs and we had scripts to do. Hey, at the end of the day, they probably saved some people's lives, man. No they might have. Battle. <laughs> yeah, that might have been one thing. Yeah. You know, and you know, like half of them probably uh, probably do. So knowing it was a quarter of the battle. Huh? So before we go to the movie, I want to talk about I'm going to jump ahead after the movie, you know, or after the aftermath of the film is that uh, the Transformers season three, the five faces of darkness, right? That five part, you know, saga was so excellently done, man. You know, oh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. So good because it picked up right where the movie left off and it gave 
a different tone to the Transformers. Like, what was your approach to that? Like, it was very great storytelling. Well, I mean, what happened was this, was that, you know, we knew after the movie, you know, we, we knew we were going into season three and we knew that it had to come after the movie. It'd just be kind of weird if, you know, we dealt like the movie didn't happen. And the very nature of the toys had changed. They'd gone from being things that were, you know, almost photorealistic to real objects on Earth. Yeah, you know, we had triple changers and there's a much more sci-fi look to things that, you know, I don't see anything that looks like, you know, Cyclonus or the sweeps running around on Earth. So we kind of knew we were going to, we were, you know, we'd go back to Earth, but we knew we were in space. And so then it was, it was all sorts of things like, oh, what, what happens when they run into aliens and they run into monsters and let's have them fight a dragon and these guys live in space anyway. Um, and, and what do they do after this war? I mean, they've just defeated, uh, defeated Unicron. And that's why the first image had to be, it's my favorite image from all the Transformers, is Unicron's head floating in space. But, you know, the first image of the Five Face of Darkness is the last image of, of the movie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we were showing, okay, we're clearly in that continuity. And, you know, we're clearly in that time period. And and I, I'm glad you liked it. I mean, obviously, season three was extremely, contra uh, you know, controversial for a, a whole host of reasons. Yeah, because it was, it was challenged. I mean, you know, that, that I, I love the fact that, you know, we are, we both saw a 35th anniversary re-release the movie. Because remember, the movie did not do well at the time. It was not perceived as a hit. As a matter of fact, it was it was perceived as a fail. And uh, you know, it, people at Hasbro were actively upset by the fact that we, uh, you know, that, that we had killed Optimus Prime, as if we just went off and did it. You know, that, you know, I mean, they knew knew it. I mean, there was you know, there's all sorts of politics going on, all sorts of things changing in the world. And there's a story that a, and this, this colored, this gets to Five Face of Darkness because I was right. I wrote five, a lot of Five Face of Darkness before the movie came out, but it was, it overlapped, you know, it certainly wasn't final until after the movie come out. So we're, we, we were reacting to the movie. And uh, uh, the story was that, that some kid had locked himself in a room for a week and everybody believed this story. Okay, first of all, you know, I don't know if he survived locking himself into a bathroom for a week. And second of all, having now been a parent, you know, at that point, I was, you know, more than a decade away from being a parent. You know, uh, you know, how long is any kid going to lock themselves in a bathroom before you knock the door down? You take off the hinges and you get the kid out of there, but it's not a week. You know, but we all believed that story. And, you know, and it kind of went through and everybody was upset. and We had to remedy this situation we created. Yeah, it was wild. even though we didn't feel we had created it. It, it was wild. Like uh, when I saw that movie, I was seven years old. I'm now 42. Um, and watching it last night in cinema was absolutely amazing. 35 years, you know, after the release, it was just a wonderful experience. And I was digesting and processing a lot of stuff. And a lot of fans might say, hey, this was to sell toys that killed off um, Ironhide and, and Optimus Prime and all that. And I'm like, no, man, like this is actually great storytelling. It, it was so nice to see the Autobot so vulnerable and on the run and Galvatron, you know, coming out there. Leonard Nimoy, dude, first of all, the voice actors, Judd I Nelson, know, unbelievable. they're unbelievable. Leonard Nimoy, Orson Welles, and where I was at at cinema last night, the sound was so big. Orson Welles yep. sounded so incredible. You know, and uh, Frank Welker. I mean, the list goes on and on. Robert Stack, you know, Peter Cullen, of course, the voice of Optimus Prime, Casey Kasem, Scatman Cuthers. I mean, it's, it's, it just goes on and on. And what I love about that film, too, is the music. Yes. The yeah, music that, of that yeah, film, I mean, Vince DiCola. That was just quintessential. 80. Vince DiCola is extraordinarily, you know, talented. Uh, you know, and and so is Stan Bush and so is everybody else that was involved in it. I'm not just saying that to be a nice guy. The fact is, you listen to that soundtrack, and what I was really struck by is just how 80s it was. I mean, it, it just encapsulated, you know, everything I liked about 80s music. It was like, you know, prog rock, you know, mm -hmm. you know, mixed with kind of, you know, I guess we'd call early metal or maybe just metal. Um, 
and uh, the you know power uh, you know uh, the touch is basically a power ballad right and absolutely it was yet somehow kind of it wasn't you know all nasty and all that and then you know you have you know weird al doing a song in there i mean i, I thought it was just great you know it was that was what really i mean you're right there's the new print that they've got it looked better than i've ever seen it it was probably a new print new projector they you know somewhere over covid they completely spoofed the theater it it was a, it was a freshness and a vividness i've i've never quite seen it with that before it was so big and so epic like to watch it last mm-hmm. night like it, it took me back to my childhood so it played with my emotions like big time and you know i know what's going on what i really liked about watching the film is that there was people that was introduced to this version of the transformers that had never been there before like there was kids in the audience and you know the parents obviously knew because we're in our 40s and 50s and whatnot in the theater and and so the kids started to pick up on the fact that like oh wait a minute is optimus prime gonna die here but i tell you they got very emotional and i was like "I, i i feel your pain kiddo i feel your pain like i was there i i watched it with my father in uh 1986 at uh premiere and i was just like so defeated even my dad he was like, wow, they 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 whacked Optimus Prime. We're Italians. So he's like, they whacked Optimus Prime. And I'm gonna go there. I've I have a theory and scenario about like how brilliant the Transformers is and how it connects to the Sopranos. But you know, here's what's up is that it, it's just su- such an emotional movie. And uh Optimus Prime, that run when he's like Megatron must be stopped, no matter the cost. Dude, he takes down the entire Decepticon army. In like what thirty seconds, Autobots right. in two days. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, it was it was really it was really it was really something, you know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it was just it, yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten how also just kind of how beautiful it was. Beautiful. Yeah, I had a friend who was a complete non-combatant. He was a guy who'd done a lot of work with it, and it's a voice actor, and he showed up and. Uh, uh, you know, and, and I, you know, I said, you ever seen any Transformer stuff before? And I said, you know, he said, no. And I said, well, this you know, won't make any sense to you. Because what was weird about the movie is it really was made for fans. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, we're going to reintroduce what Transformers are. I mean, it just started off as if you'd watched every episode of the first two, two seasons and had all the toys. Um, and he came out and he said, this was like, a big acid trip, like a, a mathematical acid trip. That's what this was like. This we came out and said, and it's like, I, and what he was reacting to was the the you know the you know, it's normal to us, but the music was just said you know and, you know underneath it, Vince Ticola is a prog rock artist, right? Mm-hmm. And and the colors. I mean, what Nelson did, I mean, especially like when you're inside of of uh, of uh, Unicron. Um, you know, it, it you know it's just just like incredible. I mean, that would that would be in an art museum if it weren't sitting in a kid children's movie, which that wasn't really a children's movie. No, you know, I mean, and that was the other thing. And you know, by season three, it's not really a kid show anymore. Oh, you know, I mean, it kind of like we figured we had sixty five, you know, episodes in season one. You know, we had 65 in season two, and you could see everything starting to evolve in season two as we were working on the movie. And so we started writing things to set up the movie. Of course, you know, we didn't have a final draft of the movie most of the time we were writing season two, but the second half of season two. But nevertheless, you know, it was morphing into something different, which I think is really good. I yeah, agree. It's not like the, the first 65 episodes are going to go away. We'll have those forever. You know, uh, season three... You could definitely tell like it was more catered to adult. But I think that after Transformers, the movie, uh, 86, of course, you know, the original Transformers, the movie, is that it was so adult themed. Like, I mean, sitting there in a cinema when you're a kid and seeing like all your childhood heroes, like Ironhide, Ratchet, all these people, Wheeljack, like that, that was a tough one. Like, because you didn't even get to see how he got done in. <laughs> it's like you just well, uh, no. I mean that. And the guy I was sitting next to, who now does conventions, does robot conventions. Uh, I was sitting next to him in the theater. You know, the moment when when Megatron just wastes Ironhide, right? Oh, said, that was the moment I knew this this film was something different. 
I mean, I knew this was going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And just, you know, boom, gone. And it was like, you know, that movie, that was the moment it made a stand. This was not going to be, you know, a big caper film and nobody gets shot. Nobody gets hurt. And everybody ends up laughing later on. We really kicked some deceptive, but you know, that stuff was in there, but you know, it was, it was really, uh, uh, you know, this would this took it to a whole different level because, you know, realistically, nobody had done that I know of a movie of, a, you know, something that was already on, you know, TV. You know, like Buck Rogers, you, were, you know, took the pilot and released it as a movie. And that was your grandfather that did that, That was that, my right? grandfather. Yep. But, but, you know, you know, so they did that. But nobody, th- this is like, you know, between seasons two and season three of an ongoing series. And they... Uh, made a movie out of it and that was kind of unknown territory and kids animation you know would spark back and and you know revive with the you know disney run of like little mermaid and and beauty and the beast and all that but it wasn't that evident at that moment that that was going to happen you know we you know nobody knew what was going to happen you know what the result of the movie was and what it never occurred to me that i'd be sitting there 35 years later talking about it it, it's un- None of us unbelievable that. unbelievable like i told my wife last night i was like you know the fact that i'm here this is happening right now i'm watching transformers the movie the original movie in theaters and the thing about it is that it starts off at such a frantic pace and it took me back and seeing it on a big screen and with the big sound and everything like that yeah the sound um, they really did oh my the god sound. the know, sound was awesome or, it or what yeah it was unbelievable. I mean, there are a couple of places where the new mix seemed to step on lines, you know, but I didn't even care because I, I knew what the lines were. Not like anybody else in the theater who, yeah, I, I, I was doing a con and then the projector, the, the sound went out. And like the audience knew all the lines. They just said the lines. We didn't even need the soundtrack. I mean, yeah, it sounded better with the soundtrack, but it was, it was pretty amazing. It's so funny that you said that. Like, normally I'd be pissed off at this sort of thing at a movie theater. There was a woman sitting next to me with her husband and she was reciting like every line. Like, yep. you know, when um, Megatron, is that you? Here's a hint. Like, you know, like I was yeah. like, but I was like, high five, girl. Yes. <laughs> That's one of the best parts of the movie. Like how yeah. badass was Galvatron when he comes in? You know, yeah. I, I did everything about that movie. Like I was telling my wife last night, um, when I, when I saw it, I was like, and anyone that would listen is that watching it as an adult, it's got a different theme to it. As a kid, yep. some people might have been pissed off about Optimus Prime dying, but this is really the adventure, in my opinion, of some younger people like, you know, Hot Rod and, you know, all the yeah. people that the Dinobots stole the show to, even though they're not yep. young. They were great. They were, they were great. Grimlock and the way they was played amazing. off a cup was incredible. Well, at the screening yep. I went to, we had Greg Berger was there. John Mashita was there. Uh, I, I'm trying to think. I, I don't want to forget anybody. But, like, we had a bunch of the voice actors were there because we just did. When you saw it, did you see some stop motion uh, shorts in front of it? No. When I saw it last night? Yeah. No. Oh, you got it. Did, did you get there early enough? That because they released, like, for our release, you know, when I saw it on Sunday. Yeah, we made three just in the last three four months. We made three stop motion shorts featuring oh. the new line of toys that are photorealistic with the uh, with the um, you know the the movie the eighty six movie, and, and and the toys look exactly like in the eighty six movie. It started when we they we kick started uh, um, Unicron. You know, which I, I just to help them do it. I mean, the guys at the, the guys at Hasbro are great. Ben Montano is, uh, uh, you know, the best toy executive in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and and you know, he's like the vintage guys when I was there in the beginning. I mean, they're just they're just out there having fun. But anyway, he said, "Yeah, let's do some stop motion because you know you want to you know really have them transform and you know we have yeah. the actual toys." So we treated it like the movie, like all of them had acted out the movie, and then they decided to animate it. And, uh, you know, so it's like blooper reels of, uh, well, yeah, you have to see it, but I, I mean, it'll be, they'll be released. I can't you know, wait one to way see or another it. Soon. Yeah. The audience, I mean, I was really proud of him, but my point was we got Stan Bush came in, he plays, a, he does a great guest. Yeah. I guessed appearance. I'm not going to tell you what he does. 
Uh, John Mashita was there. Greg Berger was there. A couple of new guys were there. And, uh, you know, it, it was, yeah, you know, it was just great. What, what about at Boogie Nights when they used uh, We Got the Touch? I mean, I, I think that was so funny. Yeah, no, it, it, <laughs> you know, because that's almost that generation. You know what I mean? You know, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you realize that movie was, was just perfect 80s. You know, oh, God, and that, yeah. and Boogie Nights is the dark side of that exact same period. Oh, it, it was so great, man. And Transformers like and everything that you've been doing is so great. I know you do video games. You know, you're, yep. you're a video gamer. My favorite video game of all time is Grand Theft Auto V. Uh, yep. I play that thing. Um, also, Red Dead Redemption. Obviously, I'm a rock yeah. star gamer. You know, yes, you are. You are an open world rock star gamer. Yeah, it, do I tell you what? My wife, she kills Zelda. Like she did. Like you know, uh, what was it? Breath of the Wild. And right. she got a hundred percent completion on this game. That game wow. is hard. Yeah, and long. Very long. So tell me about some of the games that you're into or the ones that you created, man. Well, if I go backwards, uh, I'm working on a project with a company called Deviation right now. And if you just look up Deviation, I mean, it's it's the guys that did, uh, uh, you know, Black Ops and Zombies and, you know, a bunch of other things. And they were kind of, you know, retired and all that and said, all right, we're, going, we're getting back in. And we want to do Game of the Year. That's what we're doing. Uh, and they're great. I, we have not announced the game, but you can look up the company. This is like, it's like, you know, being asked to play for, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash or something. It's just being a super group. You know, it's like get a call from the Buccaneers. Hey, hey, we, we, need, we need a running back again there. You know, no, dude, uh, I, and, I feel you. And, you and know, speaking it, of, it's, it's a great team. Speaking of sports, uh, what kind of sports are you into? Uh, really, football is the only thing I follow to any, to any great extent. I mean, I've sort of, you know, have a, a passing knowledge of everything else, but that's just, you know, just, I, I don't know, I'm a big guy. And so I like football. I don't know. For what whatever about, reason. what about music? I'm sure that, uh, obviously you're into eighties prog and stuff of that nature. <laughs> well, I was in the seventies prog before there was eighties prog. Remember I'm old. And, uh, I, I started out, it was prog and, and I listen to a lot. I mean, I would say the absolute core of my, you know, music is the obvious. It's the Beatles, the Who, the Stones, the, you know, Eric Clapton doing just about anything. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, it starts with that. But in this other weird part of my life, I discovered Prague and oddly enough, metal. We had a disc jockey, a friend of mine had a disc jockey living across the street from him. And his wife would sell these, you know, these sample you know, they, you know, just like albums that they would send to the to the uh, radio station that they never played. I picked up this one. It's called Black Sabbath. Huh? I wonder what this is. <laughs> you know, and you know, I put it on, and I'm telling you, you hear the first three chords. You know, this is, you know, yeah, this is the, these guys are onto something. You know, and yeah, I picked up a lot of stuff that you know that way. So, but yeah, I'd say that you know, and just you know, and now in my dotage, I mean, obviously, I listen to a lot of a lot of other things, but, uh, um, you know, I, I would say, yeah, I, you know, just any kind of, uh, you know, probably it starts from classic rock and works out. And, and then, you know, the thing about Prague, Prague's really classical, right? I mean, it's one kind of, of, you know, rock and roll music that has no reference to the blues or anything else. It's all the guys that were playing keyboards and, you know, in, uh, you know, school orchestra or, you know, or, you know, playing violin or something, you know, it, they did when they went out and made music and it's, you know, it's, it just comes, it comes from a different set of roots. Vince Nicola, like he's uh big into that. And I can't wait to pick his brain on it. Uh, Rocky four soundtrack is my go-to yep. gym anthem. I am a drummer yep. and also a boxer and I love all of it. his material transformer soundtrack was amazing for the movie. Like, you know, dare, um, yep, all that. Oh, no, he, so and, good. And, and we have on the new video. There's some unreleased stuff, Vince Vince Cola stuff you've never heard before that was done in the day. So you'll hear that in the background. We're trying to get him to release it and find some fun way to do it because he wow. came to Comic Con a couple of years ago and did a concert. I mean, with his whole band and these guys. They, I mean, no, and, and he's doing his best stuff now. I mean, that's that. That's the interesting thing. And Stan was there, you know. Uh, you know, was at our recording session. As I said, he makes a guest appearance. Um, and 
I even wrote a song for one of those videos, but you have to listen really hard. But it's called the Discontinued Transformer Blues, you know, and, and so you'll hear it. <laughs> you'll just hear it playing I want to hear subtly. all it's, this. It's in one of our stop motion things. Yeah, that was my one and only uh, uh, recording I ever did. So, all right, drums. Okay, so are you, uh, I, I mean, drums, I, I get it. Drums and boxing fit together. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite bands of all time. Um, I'm going to say Rush, Led Zeppelin, Tool, Chevelle. Um, I, I like a lot of 80s, Boston, Scorpions. I like a lot of yep. prog rock. Um, I also like a lot of hip hop, jazz. You know, I, I uh, mess around with Art Blakey, is one of my favorite jazz musicians yep. of all time. I like the blues. I, I pretty much like everything. It's funny that you asked me that question. Uh, my wife is into country, and I was never into country, but it's all about paying your bills, getting laid and getting paid, you know, yep. the lyrics. And I'm like, this isn't that bad. So I started getting into that too, man. You know, uh, I, you know, what happened to me is, you know, cause I put together a playlist every year of just songs that strike me for one reason or another. I just put them on the list so that I can listen to that playlist and it'll bring back 2021. And what I've yep. discovered over the past few years is a shocking amount of country in my, in my play in yearly playlist. Yeah, you know, part of it is it comes off like soundtracks for TV shows. Like I was watching Yellowstone and you, you get stuff in there like, you know, Uncle Lucius, you know, doing uh, um, you keep the wolves away. I mean, just like brilliant stuff. And, yes. you know, so I'll just Shazam it off the TV. And and then I, before that, I was watching um, Longmire. That had a lot of stuff, too. And I noticed all this country's creeping into my list and I like it. Yeah, I never, you know, I, you know, but now bear in mind, country has morphed. You know, I mean, you know, first the rock guys were ripping them off forever. And Keith Richard in his books talking about how much they loved, you know, country music. I mean, like Western, country Western stuff. And you actually listen to the Rolling Stones and a shocking amount of it is country and Western. You know, like you listen to not the version of Honky Tonk Woman we all know, but Country Honk. And it's a country song. It's the same song. You know, it's just like they went and redid it, Dead Flowers, Wild Horses. I mean, and you realize just how influential that stuff was. Oh, there's no doubt. And uh, as a, you know, appreciator of music, great music, like, you're always listening and you got to keep an open mind. So like anyone that's listening, like always be open minded to great music. Like there's something to offer from every outlet of music, like whether yep. it's jazz, blues, funk, hip hop, punk rock and roll metal like i'm a big metal guy but you were mentioning tv shows um we got uh a marathon going on on hbo right now for the sopranos and i'm gonna book right. it with this about how it relates to the transformers in a moment <laughs> yeah, i'm telling that. you i'm seeing i saw some stuff i saw things i saw things so here's what's going on uh many saints of sopranos i'm not getting paid for this people obviously comes out in theaters uh, on Friday and also HBO Max. But uh, if they want to pay me, go ahead. Uh, donations are welcome. Sponsorship is also welcome. Okay. But um, wh what are some of the shows that you watch? I'm a big Cobra Kai guy. You know, are you watching anything oh, Cobra right now? Cobra Kai was great. Okay. Oh, you know, I mean, that, uh, you know, yes. I mean, because, you know, I live in Los Angeles, right? You know, and that, that's all the Valley. And they, they do a take on the Valley. It's one of the best things I've ever seen. The show is so politically offensive, and yet they get away with it. You know, I mean, imagine, you know, and it, when he's playing the names, he's calling the, you know, that poor guy that, you know, with that, uh, you know, the disability, uh, you know, and, uh, but he's one of the, but, uh, both of them, I mean, you know, both the characters are just two of the freshest characters to show up on TV, and they're from a movie that's 30 years old. But somehow, whatever they did, I, yeah, I love Cobra Kai. Uh, Bosch, you want to listen to some interesting jazz because that's where Art Blakely showed up on my playlist. Was if you would listen to Bosch, that's all he listens to. I mean, it's your pure LA, you know, noir, you know, done, you know, present day. And he, he, yeah, it, it, jazz is very much, you know, in the front of it. Uh, so that, that's been great. Yellowstone, I love that one. And, you know, and then then we were watching a bunch of crap. You know how you go through the slow periods and like everything you watch oh, yeah. sucks, and it's this bad, depressing stuff that you get three episodes in and think, hey, I don't even want this in my head. So a friend of mine, uh, actually one of the guys I'm working with, said, "Have you ever watched Band of Brothers?" And I realized incredibly, I hadn't watched Band of Brothers. And that's one of the best. Have you ever seen that? It's Steven Spielberg oh, and yeah. Tom Hanks. That's it's probably twenty excellent. years ago. 
Excellent. Yeah, so we just got ago. done watching that. And then I said, okay, we're not going to watch any crap for a while. So now we're watching the crown, which is just it also just brilliant. You know? And I mean, it's, it, it, you know, I mean, it, sometimes you like crap, but I mean, you know, I, I just said, you know, I had too much crap and nothing good, you know? So that was it. And there, there are other shows I'm trying to, Oh, you want to see, okay. You want to see interesting, you know, something I would argue it's metal. You can watch yourself. It's a show called Britannia. Yeah, it, it's it's Romans versus Druids, and uh, this it's true. And the soundtrack, the 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 theme song is "Hurdy Gurdy Man." You know, at the beginning of it. So this is a period piece set, you know, 100 AD, with "Hurdy Gurdy Man" playing, and that's relevant to you because that is the first time Jimmy Page and John Bonham ever played together. Is Donovan got them together and said, "Hey, you guys got to, you know, you, you guys got to do that." And you listen to Hurdy Gurdy Man through those years and you hear it. It's Zeppelin, you know, it's a different version of Zeppelin that had, you know, Donovan as lead man and not, uh, you know, Robert, Robert Plant. Plant you know? Yeah. 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 I got to check that. That that sounds amazing, dude. I got to check that out for sure. All right. So my comparison, so Sopranos and Transformers, the there, there is a comparison here. Yeah. I was, wa- I was watching the film last night saying to myself, Megatron is obviously Tony Soprano. Right. Starscream <laughs> yeah. is Christopher. Yep. Yep. One hundred percent. You know, Soundwave yeah. is Silvio. Right. And I had to figure out like who's Paulie Walnuts? Who is Paulie Walnuts? And I'm like, Shockwave. Because I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because he's that. always keeping things on point. Like uh, he's always keeping things like very, you know, because Paulie Walnuts <laughs> Sopranos is very neat. Shockwave's always telling Megatron what's going on. Like, I mean, Soundwave is really good, but he's like the Silvio, you know, right. where he's kind of like always updating him about what you should do type of thing, you know. Uh, well, that's, yeah, that's how that's how we always wrote him. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, obviously Starscream's the most treacherous guy. He's also my favorite Transformer, my, by the way. I was the most that. treacherous guy. <laughs> you know, who was you your favorite one to write for? Was it Starscream? Oh yeah, because I mean, I was doing it for Chris Lotta, right? And he was what made our great actor. Different. Oh, I mean, he lived just out of the edge of human possibility. I mean, you know, I mean, any one of those other guys, you know, I mean, Greg or you know, Frank Welker or you know, any of those guys are much more, you know, like seasoned real voice actors. But Lotta had a frantic, frenetic energy, and he had a character and a voice. That I think really defined our shows. I mean, all the way through from G.I. Joe when he's Cobra Commander to mm-hmm. uh, all the way to Inhumanoids when he's decomposed and and uh, Visionaries, you know, I mean, yeah. And, you know, so he, uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, Starscream also, I just, I just love writing those characters because, you know, I mean, bad guys are just always, you know, a lot more fun to write than good guys because, you know, they're bad guys, right? Yeah. That's why you're talking about the Sopranos, right? I'm not hearing a bunch of police guys who are the Autobots. But I'll tell you who the Autobots were. Is the Autobots were the Chicago 85 Bears. Because that was the season they went to the Super Bowl. And when I was watching the movie, I was remembering who was who. Okay, I'm remembering you know, Hot Rod was Jim McMahon. I remember that. You know, and you had to make Blur Willie Gold because, you know, he was an Olympic speedster. Anyway, you don't want to hear about the 85 Bears. But the point is, is uh, Cup was Mike Ditka. You know, uh, you know, the point is, I just modeled them because I was so into it. And then the bad guys were guys on other teams I didn't like, you know, like, you know, yeah, obviously Megatron's Lawrence Taylor. And, and, you know, yeah, so that was. uh, Isn't it funny how we do this Uh, for Optimus Prime? um, If I got to think about any character in film, maybe like Clint Eastwood, like Western, you know, because it's John Wayne. John Wayne, I mean, that that's was, right. Originally, yep, he was the model for Optimus. And that's when, you, you know, I, I, do you know about my book? I wrote a book called The Games Master about all this. When we were doing the death scene, that the book starts with this. Okay. Uh, Steve Gerber was was this story editor on G.I. Joe, but he was helping me with, you know, the Optimus, not the death scene itself, but the fight scene before the death, right? All the way through the death. Um and he brings his buddy in. His buddy's this comic book guy from New York who's doing, you know, it looks like John Lennon or something, you know, who's doing a uh, um, Batman comic book. And so he's trying to figure out how to have Batman fight Superman. And I'm trying to figure out how to kill Optimus Prime. And, you know, of course, his comic, it was, was The Dark Knight, right? It's Frank Miller. 
And, and I mean, it's one of those moments that popular culture just grew out of that. I mean, think of that, you know, how all that rippled down for the last 35 years. But what Frank said that was really interesting is I was saying, you know, I want Optimus's death to be like when I was a kid, what devastated me the same way. I was five years old because I saw it in the theaters, right? You know, and when I was a kid, you didn't have VHSs and stuff like that. So you had to see it when it was out or you'd wait, you know, several years to see it on TV, but the cell was out. So I had to be a five or six. I can't remember. But point is, is that I never forgot. I mean, I, you know, you know, like a decade later, I actually saw the Alamo again. I remember Davy Crockett's death shot by shot. You know, it, it, it was, it was the closest thing to Optimus dying for, you know, your generation. Right. And, and that's what I was trying to emulate. And Frank was saying, you ever see the 300 Spartans? And, I, and I'd never had, you know, and he said, well, that's, you know, hey, you ought to see that. That's how the death ought to happen. You know, um, you know cause that was, a, you know, you, everybody has that movie when they're a kid when they go in there and like the hero dies and they didn't know that happened in movies. And with me, it happened with the Alamo with you, it happened with transformers, you know, and you never forget that and you never let go of it. And it becomes really epic. The dialogue between Megatron and Optimus prime during that death scene, when, you know, you know, Megatron's like, why would you want to throw away your life so recklessly? And Optimus prime says, you know, that's a question you should ask yourself, Megatron. And he's like, no, I want to do it with my bare hands. Optimus Prime pretty much kicks his ass in this battle. You yeah. know, he pretty much has his way with him. Hot Rod comes in. Now, uh, uh, when, I, when yeah. I was a kid, Hot Rod pissed me off because I'm like, man, you're the reason why Optimus Prime's dead. You know, uh, Prime had him. You know, he's like, you know, you're someone that shows no mercy, but now you're pleading for it. You know, I thought you were made of sterner stuff. So he wanted Megatron to bust a move, in my opinion, right? Right. So what happened? Well, we, we were doing Dirty Harry. I know what you're thinking about. <laughs> exactly. You fire six shots or only five. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it was like that's that uh standoff, that western type thing. Yeah. And then Prime goes down. I love I love the fact that he didn't get sold out. He says never. And then I'm watching this movie last night again for like the hundredth time. And so I'm watching it and I'm saying this is a journey of great characters that are building arcs. Like uh, Hot Rod yep. has a character arc, like it, it's beautiful, and I like that they're like so, like they're 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 the weaker, like they're being stalked the whole time, like you know they're just getting dogged out all the time. Galvatron's on that ass; he got to make sure he pleases Unicron to stay alive. And what I want to mention about season three, now I'm thinking about Galvatron. I love that you guys made him completely. I have to use the word fucking nuts. <laughs> yeah well we had to we had to play him against megatron because megatron you know megatron was actually pretty sane i mean he made sense he you know and yeah. and all that and we didn't have starscream anymore to be nuts so we brought him back you know later on but the point is for a long time we didn't have starscream and so we we decided hey you know if you got you know you know transmutated by some giant planet that you know that you know you know reforms you into another being you know, you'd be kind of, and then you lost a war and, you know, you had the matrix in your hand, you lost, you'd be kind of whacked too. So the idea was you just make, you know, him nuts. And, and, you know, Hot Rod had to blow it during the Optimus fight because he had to go into it feeling really unworthy. And what he realizes the matrix picked him, he, you know, I mean, he, he did not think he was, you know, he was uh, worthy of it. You know, everybody, you know, Ultra Magnus was the obvious guy. Yeah, I mean, you know, he had the uh, similar look to Optimus Prime. And, you know, yep. I, I had watched uh, a couple episodes from the uh, Japanese version where you get to see Ultra Magnus actually introduced, because I'm a diehard, um, you know, before the movie. Um, but great character, Robert Stack, ev ev all the voice actors, Judd Nelson. Robert, all right, Robert Stack was the big deal of all the actors to meet. I mean, different ones were cool. I mean, to meet like an actual guy from Monty Python, you know. You know oh, my God. Or yes. Uh, I'd, I'd met Orson Welles before, so that wasn't the first time I met him. But, um, you know, I, I mean, no, these guys, Judd Nelson was a lot of fun. He's a big Miami Dolphins fan. And, uh, um, uh, it, it, no, it was great. But Robert Stack, like when I was a kid, you talk about The Sopranos. And my mother admit, let me, you know, stay up late. I'd been particularly good or I'd done all my chores or whatever I'd done. So I could stay up to <gasps> 10 o'clock. They should let me watch The Untouchables. 
which is to this day a really scary show. And I would argue they made a movie with Kevin Costner movie, The Untouchables, but Robert Stack was Elliot Ness. And I, I mean, he, he, you know, I mean, he was of all the guys, wow, this is Robert Stack. And he was the most, like, I've never done voiceover before. I mean, you know, and he was great. He was incredibly humble and modest. And, and I mean, he's not like most actors. His family owned Occidental Petroleum. You know, so, I mean, it's not like he was on welfare or something, you know, or he really needed the check. Um, yeah, but he was great. I, I was thrilled to see Robert Stack, you know, and he ended up having a big voice over career and unsolved mysteries later on. I mean, because he sounded great in that movie. It made everything it sound so amazing, like weirdly Victorian and creepy at the same time. What about like an airplane? He was so you know, good. Yeah. And then he turns into a comedy guy, but that was a genius <laughs> of airplane. I mean, Leslie Nielsen spent his whole career doing these straight man roles so did uh, uh what's his name jeff uh you know lloyd bridges they were all serious robert stack they were guys you knew to serious stuff so then when you're seeing him be these goofballs it just makes it funnier absolutely an airplane when you see the guy come up to pick up you know robert stack to drive him to the airport and get things going as the commander or whatever like that might be the one of the most funniest scenes I've ever seen yep. in movie history. Like when they take yep. that turn and all the horses are are, are gone like behind yeah. them and stuff. It's just like so crazy. It's like that movie is just absolutely ridiculous. I actually played that for my uh, twelve year old stepdaughter just recently, and she was dying of laughter. I'm like, these are the movies that stand up. These are the movies that yep. stand the test of time. Last night I saw kids. I saw people watching Transformers. And they were all in, like, you yep. know, like I said, the older people like myself giving high fives, but like the kids, like I heard them asking her parents questions, like what, what's, what's going on? You know, um, what I do love about everything that the Transformers is, it's very, you know, advanced. It's not a kid's show. I totally agree with it. No, like it's, not, not by season three. No, and not the movie. Certainly not a children's no, show. No, no. Like you're, you're you gonna know, grow I mean, real fast just, if you watch that. Oh, I'm. Mean, you were asking about. Uh, when we, I, I can come back and we can talk. You know, we can talk more again. But you're asking about Five Faces of Darkness, and my fantasy yes. is eventually what I want to do. Five Faces of Darkness was beset with a lot of problems, not the least of which was, you know, after uh, you know, a lot of things were going on, but we had a new animation company. And, you know, we, we got whole scenes we didn't get back, shots we didn't get back. And it was just not well animated. So I want to take that, edit it, make it the way it should be, and release it like a second part of the Transformers movie, which I think the world would be open for. You get all the shots right. You do all the in-betweening right. <clears throat> you do the deal. You get Stan and, and, you know, Vince to come back and do the soundtrack again. I mean, you do today's version of that soundtrack. And that I think it would amazing. be a huge companion piece. And you don't even have to do anything new. You just go fix what's there. You know, you relight or re-edit it. I'd love to get Nelson back to do it because he's still doing stuff. Nelson was great. and uh, Unbelievable. One of my favorite episodes is The Ghost of Starscream. I thought that was, yep. was so bad. I told you, I, I had to get Starscream back in the thing. And the only way I could do it at that point was make him a ghost. So we got him back. Oh, it was so cool. And my, my wife, like, now she's getting into it because I have, like, this ability to, like, you know, put things on her, like, where it's like, hey, uh, want to watch this boxing match or this UFC fight tonight or, like, whatever I'm into. And, hey, Star Wars and, like, all this because I'm, I'm into my stuff. And when I get in, I get really in. And uh, she asked me, she's like, when I showed her the death of Starscream, she was like, uh, does he come back? Like, he's a big character. I'm like, I'll spoil it for you if you want. He comes back and he has, uh, you know, things to do with Unicron and Unicron and Starscream want to get revenge on Galvatron. Right. <laughs> I thought that was a brilliant episode. It was so good. Well, that's, and, that's what we wanted to do. I mean, because if anybody would side with Unicron, it would be Starscream. Yeah, yeah of I course. Always thought that Unicron picked the wrong guy. Starscream would have been all in. You know, and, uh, you know, so, they, yeah. The, the best thing is, again, like, I that think was my, my wife, that would be fun. My favorite scene of, I think, Transformers. Well, I have two Transformers movie after watching it last night is when Prime comes out and just takes on the whole Decepticon army, 
fights Megatron. I mean, how do you, how do you deny that? But when Galvatron yes. shows up on Starscream, and yes, oh, that is the coolest thing. <laughs> like there is yeah, no yeah, absolutely f's given. Absolutely. Sorry. So I, I got I got one more episode for you. Rude Awakening, sure. where yeah, well, Optimus oh, yeah, Prime dies again. <laughs> well, okay. So here's the gag with that. Um, the worst possible lowest moment of Transformers. Uh, well, you know, after the movie bombed and and Hasbro's mad anyway, kid locks himself in the bathroom, which I just don't believe that happened. But anyway, th- everybody did then, so it doesn't matter whether it happened or not. Um, uh. They, uh, we, you know, Steve Gerber and I'd figure out, yeah, we had to bring Optimus back, like from the undead, you know, because we have guys like, he wants to read something amazing, take a look at Marv Wolfman's horror work when he was right, when he was doing horror comics. I mean, this is a guy, you know, who's like, there's nothing Marv Wolfman hasn't written. I mean, he was like, a, you know, child editor of DC Comics. I mean, yeah, just an extraordinary career. And he's still great. He's doing games. He wrote some of the best horror ever. So we're sitting around. Yeah, let's bring Optimus back and we'll make him a zombie and then we'll kill him again. You know, and this was before we were in trouble. And uh, so that thing's like cruising because we wanted season three to be a lot darker and, and to, to you know, really sort of deal with all the issues of, you know, I mean, no, we've never done a Transformers ghost story before. We've never done a Transformers zombie story. You know, let's set a whole thing in like wherever the Transformer mausoleum is. Let's go there, you know, and, you know, and let's have fight dragons. And, you know, I mean, just and deal, you know, go to all these sleazy planets and, um, you know, just because we could, you know, and and we sort of everybody knew that era was coming to an end. Uh, the toy show, there's a lot of legend. There are a lot of things but anyway. So we, we have that well down the way in production. And we get this thing, you must bring Prime back. That was a terrible mistake. We had scolded, right? And they got Marv to write The Return of Optimus Prime because at that point I was already on, uh, I think I was writing uh, what would grow up to be Tiny Tunes at that point. But anyway, and uh, um, so, uh, and, and Marv did, did that stuff really well. And uh, um, so you know, this thing's in the pipeline and we, we don't really have the heart to tell Hasbro that, oh yeah, we got this thing where we kill him again on there. Because, you know, I mean, because it's one of those, you know, you know, moral, practical decisions where, you know, if you tell them they're just going to get mad and they'll do something precipitous and it could all go bad. If you don't tell them, you're going to get in trouble. We all figured, OK, you know, by the time they find out, you know, we'll be doing something else anyway. You all play um, with our emotions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, but, it, you know, it's just, it, you know, at that point we knew the characters so well and we'd working on them so much and we we're kind of having fun with it. And there was this irreverent sense because, I mean, I, th- I have two opposite feelings about, you know, all the carnage in the movie. One is I feel, uh, you know, I feel bad about it in the sense that we sort of had a deal with kids that, you know, nothing bad would happen. You watch Transformers, you're in a real life safe space. But, you know, that was TV, not movies. But, you know, and, but the other, the other is we wouldn't be talking about this if we had, you know what I mean? That it, it would have been kind of as forgotten as all those other shows. You know, one of those last time we had a conversation on mask or, you know, or, uh, you know, all the other stuff that was up against or you know, go butts. I mean, you had, you know, see a lot of go, 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 but well, fan action. I'm sure there is, but what I think was that it was a bold move watching that film last night for transformers, the movie, it was very bold and ambitious and different. Most people wouldn't, you know, uh, kill off the uh, main character that someone had loved for a long time. But I also like the desperation. Again, going back to the Autobots, like they're yep. on the run. And then we have this new guy, Galvatron, who's galvanized, you know, like going yep. out there. You know, um, it was like he made a deal with the devil, Megatron did, you know, yep. and he got reborn and baptized and became Galvatron. And like we saw the first look of him when he comes out and blasts out Starscream, like how powerful this man is. Like, yep. whoa, like he yeah. could do that. Like that, that's and Starscream is a decorated officer. So I think and that the death that, was so good where all the shot, you know, the bolts went around him and he steps uh, on the man, crown. He you crumbles know. to ashes. Yeah. And he gets yeah. the he gets the crown and steps on it. He goes falling down the steps. Yeah. Rumble's like I ripped that off from Roman what? history. Where Galva got killed, and they dumped his head down the Capitoline steps. You know that was stolen from ancient history. 
I love when Rumble says, what did he say his name was? <laughs> He's a cow yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Leonard and Nimoy's little, voice was so amazing. The little characters were just so funny in there. You know, you know, I mean, yeah, just the, you know, the guys, you know, just the, in that, that's what's fun is you, you'd have these intense moments and you balance it off with something funny. But wait, yeah. I live. Want to bet? <laughs> exactly. The, yeah. Starscream, he, you know, yeah. that, that's just crazy. Starscream was looking for that opportunity. He did it all throughout the entire saga. Yep. And that's why he knew. He's like, Megatron, is that you? Because he was pissing his pants if he had them. <laughs> he knew what was yeah. going on. And that's my favorite line in the film. Here's a hint. He just takes them out. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. It's just so good. He does not hesitate. He rolls on the set hard, man. But uh, I tell you what, man, like Transformers, uh, obviously, I think one of the greatest franchises of all time. Do you have any thoughts on the uh, Netflix series that was recently released? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, what I've seen, I really like. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I have to watch this stuff. My wife's not going to watch Transformers with me. Uh, and I've watched it, so I have to, like, actually sit down and do it. But, yeah, I mean. These are really ta- talented guys. I mean, after DeSanto's working on it and George Christick, and it's just great stuff. I'm doing a project with Don Murphy, who's a producer on the movies. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that I mean, you know, because they, they, they're, you know, they're doing something obviously totally different than we were doing. And it's not, it's not something, I mean, if I were going to do Transformers again, I and mean, frankly, I loved writing these little, just these little, you know, stop motion shorts, you know, they're just kind of these silly things you do for no reason. Um, and, and I really, you know, that was, uh, that was a really good moment. And, and I really loved writing the characters again and then being in there with the voice actors and, you know, with Vince and, and uh, Stan, it was like, it was like, yeah, wow, this is fun. It was really fun writing, but I mean, I definitely see it a lot more comedic and lighter than, you know, modern writers, just I different think- time. I think there's a great story to be told with the uh, origins of Megatron and Optimus Prime on Cybertron, like how Orion Pax, you know, turned into Optimus Prime, how Megatron was born. Uh, you Did know. you uh, wait? Have you read uh, Autocracy? No, it's a graphic novel series that Chris Matson and I did with Livio Ramondelli. Oh, like, please! I, I would love to read. Oh, that. yeah, no, we did that in the in the. Uh, Let's see where, oh, the Autocracy Trilogy. Look, it's right here. I try to keep these things here. Uh, This, uh, Chris Metzen, Livio Robindelli, and I did it. Okay, Chris Metzen is the guy who created Warcraft, Starcraft, Diablo. I mean, he's created Lead of Blizzard, right? Diablo and later Overwatch, right? We're sitting there working on Diablo 3. He said, hey, will you write a Transformers graphic novel with me? It's, It's only 22 pages. 300 Jeez. plus pages and th- two years later we were done you know it's just i mean you know it is he's a really you know brilliant guy obviously but and that was a lot of fun and leave you know, just the artwork's fabulous but it is exact it is an idw continuity you'll see little shots of g1 in there but basically what it really is is uh it's a story of the rise of of uh well not through the rise of megatron but who these guys were certainly the origin story when when uh, um, uh, you know, Orion uh, Pax, um, yeah, Orion Pax. Sorry, uh, Alpha Trion, yeah. Prime, yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah, all that stuff. So, well, you're in there; they're cops, basically, in this thing, and uh, things go. Yeah, you know, they're counter terrorist troops or whatever you want to call them, and things start going bad. It's, oh, it's but it's good. I, I want to read that for sure, dude. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's it, it's all an IDW <laughs> universe, so I mean, I, you know, do not expect it to be like a movie. I, I love the idea of, um, you know, seeing something like that, like, uh, you know, Cybertron's a very interesting place, you know, uh, and Alpha Trion, amazing, uh, Optimus yep. Prime when he was Orion Pax, you know, Alita One. Yeah, it's like, all in there, and you meet yeah, all of, the, all of the, uh, you know, you meet Zeta Prime and Alpha, you know, you meet all these guys in there. I mean, it's very much like a, an early origin story. Uh, and it's, you know, it's much kind of harder and higher acting and, you know, nasty fighting and proto form and stuff like that. That would make for an amazing movie. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you know, or a show. Yeah, there's so many things to get, so many things to do with this stuff. So, I mean, yeah, that, but that's what that was. That was, it was very much, that was stuff that, you know, didn't even exist when we were doing it. You know, 
in my opinion, I still believe the Quintessons created the Transformers and, you know, will not be, you know, you know, will not do a lot, you know, you know, leave that opinion. But that's just my opinion. That's awesome. Flint, you and yours have a great evening tonight. Um, I'm going to be posting everything to iHeart, Spotify, iTunes, all that kind of great stuff. Great. Yeah, just send me a link when you have it. I, I, this is a big honor. Like, you have no idea how much this meant to my childhood. I, I, it's fun to do it. It's really fun to do it. You're a great guy. Right. I appreciate you. Oh, yeah. And also, too, as long as we're here, here is, yeah, yeah to, so there is a book called The Games Master where I tell all these old stories, right? You know, and, and uh, it, you know, it's all about the 80s and doing Transformers and Joe and Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, all sorts of other. other yeah, stuff. I did research so, on that too, my man. Yeah, I, I, I saw a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, all right. You guys have a great night, bro. I appreciate you so much. Okay, man. good. Talk to you later on. All right, much bye -bye. love, brother.